Hello and welcome to today's webinar, 0.5 millimeter, a case study in miniaturization. I'm Lisa Riga with SAE Media Group, the moderator for this 60-minute program. Our speaker is John Meyer, a fellow R&D product development engineer for Automotive North America at TE Connectivity. John is responsible for the development of new terminal and connector systems and has more than 30 years of experience in new product development with 87 patents that span a broad range of products. During his presentation, you may submit questions by using the Ask a Question box on your screen. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can in the second half of the webinar. You may also download a copy of his slides under the Event Resources link. Also under Event Resources is a PDF of a white paper on Automotive Connector Strategies and Solutions for Space Reduction. And now, here is our speaker, John Meyer. Okay, hello everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, the big excitement these days in the automotive world is the electrification of the vehicle, you know, high voltage, high current connectors, fast charging, and those types of things. So you might be asking yourself, you know, why do a webinar on miniaturization? Well, the reason is we don't want you to lose sight of the low voltage side of these new electric vehicles either. There are lots of, you know, the 050 size terminal systems that we're going to talk about today have been around for 10 years now, but for various reasons, the, the 0.64 size systems, which are, are the previous uh, the smallest system typically used, are, are still the predominant terminals and connectors used for these very low current and voltage circuits. So there's a lot of opportunity for space and weight savings on the low voltage side of the vehicle that have really not been fully taken advantage of. And those reasons, a lot of reasons there, it's if you have something that you're using presently and it's working, you know, it's it's uh, going to something smaller that's new is, is a big jump. And um, with the electrification of the vehicle, this just represents a really good opportunity to kind of question what you've been doing in the past and try to, to use some of these newer systems, which can provide a significant space and weight savings. Here at TE, we launched the world's first 0.5 millimeter automotive connectors in Japan in 2006. And global sharing of best demonstrated practices and lessons learned have allowed TE to optimize its 0.5 terminal and connector designs for robustness and performance. So today we're gonna share with you uh, the things that we've learned and incorporated along the way. So first, we're going to talk about some of the miniaturization drivers that are out there, the different applications that really lend themselves to miniaturization, talk about some of the design strategies that we've employed here at TE and the challenges that we had to overcome, and talk about the, the TE.5 design advantages, once again, that experience that we've gained since 2006, and then you know we'll show you the portfolio of, of, of products that we have uh, for the 0.5 millimeter size uh, to really take advantage of uh, the opportunities in, in miniaturization. So more and more electrical systems keeping added to vehicles, I mean, a premium car can have up to 150 ECUs, um, you know, with over five kilometers of, of wiring in a vehicle. So in, in some cases, you know, the, the wiring harness can actually be the, the third heaviest component in the vehicle. You know, these harnesses can weigh up to 60 kilograms. So there really is a lot of opportunity to save space and weight uh, on the low voltage side by taking advantage of these smaller systems. And of course, that, that weight savings is gonna be very beneficial when it comes to reducing emissions and you know with elect electric vehicles extending our um the, the the driving capabilities there so very very good opportunities here for miniaturization and 
you know, just this is just a, a short list of, of opportunities, but even the very first one there in an LED headlamp, there can be up to 60 circuits, you know, 15 connectors, 120 terminals. So even just that one example alone, there's quite a lot of, of, of terminals and connectors and wiring in these systems. And, you know, something like, uh, you know, a, a lot of these applications, need very low profile design. So if you have a, a single row 050 connector, I like the one shown on the left there with a side latch, that's a very, very low profile connector system, which really lends itself nicely to headliner type applications or something in a, in a battery pack. So once again, the size um, opportunities and the space saving opportunities are pretty significant. So, so don't look and lose sight of those opportunities in these electric vehicles and, and really challenge what the status quo, you know, why is this 0.64? Why can't we use um, an 050 product here uh, to save um, space and especially to save weight? Okay, so as we look at miniaturization, the parts need to be small, but they still need to be robust, um, both mechanically and electrically. Um, a lot of times people seem to forget that the, the laws of physics do not change just because a terminal is small. You still need to generate the proper normal force in the proper way. And when I say the proper way, what I mean is you have to do it in a very controlled fashion so that it's not sensitive to tolerance variations because if you generate too much normal force, that affects the connector mating force. And if your mating forces are too high, then they have trouble getting the connectors mated at the assembly line and you're not meeting your US CAR-25 ergonomic requirements. And if there's too little force, you can have electrical issues because you don't get a good electrical connection. So they need to be robust both mechanically and electrically. From a manufacturability standpoint, there are a number of different areas that you need to be concerned with. Now, as a component supplier at TE here, we need to be, be sure that our extremely small designs here are, are still manufacturable. You know, we need to be able to fill very thin walls. We have to be able to handle these parts during our component assembly processes. We need to be able to reel them without damage get them from place to place in the plant to get things assembled. You have to be able to go through feeder bowls. Um, assembly is, is more challenging when parts are small because you have a, a smaller target area to shoot for. <laughs> and um, we also have to be able to, to get those parts shipped to our customers without being damaged. The harness maker also has to be able to manufacture and, and do their part of the process. You know, they need to crimp the terminals, they need to be able to load them into connectors. They need to be, act, act, be able to activate the secondary locking features. Um, so we have to keep in mind the harness maker. At the automotive assembly plant, they need to be able to handle the harnesses. They have to be able to get the connectors mated. They have to be able to activate the connector position assurance features uh, it, and to make sure that everything is properly connected if, if, if applicable. And we also have to keep in mind the field service people. You know, they need to be able to have access to the connector latches and and CPAs and, and and ISLs as well. They need to be able to to take these things apart and service them if necessary. So, if to have a successful design, you, you have to satisfy all three of these things. Um, otherwise, you know you're going to have have issues. Okay, so as you start to think about miniaturization and you have a clean sheet of paper in front of you, typically the, the, the first place to start is downsizing. You know, in, in this case, this is the next size smaller terminal system than a 0.64, and 0.64 is the predominant terminal in a vehicle today. So typically what you would do is you would look at your 0.64 design and you would try to downsize it. And the advantage of that is that you, you have product familiarity. You know, you, your customers are already familiar with your 
your connector designs and features and your terminal features. Um, so that product familiarity is, is a good thing. There's other advantages of having a product family that we'll talk about later as far as common lockup points and things. But typically, that's the first step is try to downsize the 0.64. Um, it, it, from a manufacturing side, it also allows PE, for instance, to, to reutilize existing molding presses and stamping presses and, and other equipment. You know, it's a, a, a similar type of design, simply smaller, and you can, you know, share that equipment. That just simplifies, you know, our manufacturing footprint as well. But there are cases where downsizing can be problematic, and that's when you don't meet the performance or the robustness needs of the market, or manufacturing becomes an issue because of really thin walls or something like that. And in the case of the 0 0.5 millimeter terminals, that really, it, it makes it a very good um, case study for miniaturization because the 0.5 millimeter terminal size is so much smaller than a 0.64 that it just wasn't possible to simply downsize. You know, there, there are other U.S. car sizes, for instance, the, the larger size is like a 1.5 millimeter terminal to a 1.2 millimeter terminal, not a big difference there. Even going from 1.2 millimeter terminals down to 0.64 millimeter terminals wasn't a very big step. You know, a lot of 0.64 millimeter terminal connector designs are simply downsized versions of their big brothers, you know, the, but in the case of 0 0.5, it's so much smaller that in some cases th there can be issues. So that's kind of the, the purpose of our webinar today is to kind of go over some of those challenges. And, you know, it basically it's, it's what we did and we, we found that we really needed to, to do some things a little bit differently in some cases. So once again, for the PE's 0.5 millimeter terminal designs, you know, first we benchmarked the 0.64 terminal designs. We, you know, work very closely with our global counterparts uh, and we learn from their experiences and where necessary then we also incorporate new innovations. So that's what we're going to be talking about here in, in great detail today. So prior to U.S. CAR, there was a huge variety of terminal systems out there. Um, and one of the things that U.S. CAR did was they started to standardize on certain sizes and basically pin shapes um, so that there wasn't so, so much variety out there. And um, th they also tried to standardize on testing specifications. Um, so, you know, certainly most of you are probably familiar with U.S. CAR and, you know, the very good work they do. And in 2012 is when U.S. CAR introduced the 0.5 millimeter size terminal system to their test specifications and to their, their header interface drawings. Um, and th the size difference is pretty dramatic. You know, if you look at the, at the chart on the top right, it shows some size comparisons um, between the 0.64 terminal, which is on the top, and the 0.5 millimeter terminal, which is underneath it. So, so looking at the height dimension, you know, the 0.64 terminal was 2.25 millimeters high. The 050 terminal is only 1.15. That, that's about half. And the, the width of the terminal, you know, is 1.6 on the 0.64, and it's only 1.0 on the 050. That's significantly narrower as well. Then the length is instead of 6.5 millimeters, it's 5.6 millimeters. And the stock thicknesses are also typically less because you're trying to crimp in, in some cases to smaller wires even. So typically a 0.64 terminal is maybe 0.2 millimeter stock thickness or even 0.25. And with the 050, they're typically more like 0.15 millimeter stock thickness. So these aren't just baby steps here. This is dramatic decrease in size. So once again, that really makes it a challenge from the design standpoint because you still do need to generate proper normal forces and once again you need to do it in a proper way and there's so little material to utilize to do that that you have to take every little bit of the material that you have available with these miniaturized designs 
and get energy out of it, basically. There's only so much energy there because there's such a small amount of material. So it becomes a real challenge to do things in a proper way. Um, and, you know, fortunately for, for us in North America, uh, TE Japan was really the leaders in miniaturization. They released their O50 series terminals and connectors to the Japanese market in 2006. And their miniaturization effort was really, really focused on miniaturization. I mean, they, they were they were targeting 1.5 millimeter pitch between terminals, uh, which is extremely small. If you're familiar with the U.S. car spec, um, you know, the, the U.S. car interface drawing is typically a 2.0 millimeter pitch. So in Japan, they're even much tighter than that. So, you know, the 1.5 millimeter pitch, in order to achieve that, they needed to use ultra thin insulation on the wires. Um, once again, here in North America, we typically prefer thin wall insulation rather than the ultra thin wall. So there's a lot of regional differences that drive differences in design, but the Japanese really focused on miniaturization. So on the header side, typically they use surface mount designs. You know, with the surface mount design, you're able to very closely package the circuits uh, because you don't need a hole in a printed circuit board with an annular ring and you know that takes up space so so in order to get that really tight pitch typically they use surface mount designs and if they want to use a through hole type header they would stagger the pins so if you have a two row header you would have four rows of holes in the printed circuit board and every other pin in the header would be a long pin and a short pin and a long pin and a short pin so even with the 1.5 millimeter pitch on the plug side, you can still do through hole connectors, but it simply you know, makes the manufacturing process a little bit more complex. But once again, the, the surface mount design, which allows you to have that tight pitch is a big advantage. The other advantage of a surface mount design is it's the connector is sitting on the top of the board. So if you're trying to miniaturize a module the area where the connector sits on the board is now available on the bottom side of the board to put other surface mount components on in that area. So if you really want to achieve module miniaturization, then surface mount is the way to go because it frees up quite a lot of board real estate that you can use for, for, for other things. The other advantage to surface mount is that um, it, when you're manufacturing the module, if you're using surface mount and you're reflowing you know the solder that's the same process that all the other components on the board are seeing so it's not an extra process like you know going through a wave soldering process or um, even a compliant pin where you're pressing a header onto the board with surface mount it's the same process as everything else so you would you know, populate one side of the board you know flip the board then populate the other and you know the, the header gets soldered at the same time as the other components. So, um, so, so that's the upside. You know, the downside to a surface mount header is that it's a little more expensive because you have to use high temperature plastics for the header because they have to be able to withstand those high reflow temperatures. And the other thing is we typically put a, like a metal uh, strain relief on each end of the connector, which also gets soldered to the printed circuit board to protect those you know, surface mount solder joints. So the cost of the header is, is a little bit more expensive, but the downstream processing when making the module um, is less because once again, it's just the same process as all the other um, components that are being applied to the board. And the other thing that they did in Japan, which you know is, is pretty amazing is they have some three row plugs where they actually have seven components make up the plug housing and it's actually a wafer design. So you have a bottom wafer and you load the terminals into that wafer, then you snap another wafer on and you load the second row of terminals and you snap another wafer on and you actually end up stacking seven, you know, th th there's, there's seven separate components, you know, four sets of wafers and, and a couple of other components there to make up, you know, a single plug. But by doing it that way, they could really get those rows close together. So I mean, they really took miniaturization seriously and, you know, um, came up with some really ingenious designs in order to get very, very small. And once again, you look at those dimensions in that chart, you know, the 050 
takes is 70% smaller. I mean, that is, that's really significant. So once again, that, that made this transition from 0.64 to 0.5 really challenging and, um, and very, very exciting. And it's fun to, uh, to try to design something, you know, in, in the most efficient way. Um, and, and we think that based on, on the experience that we have here globally, um, you know, once again, we think our designs um, are up to the challenge there. So for this webinar, what I wanted to do is just take a look at each of these different dimensions and features of, of the terminal and just try to describe how it affects, like if, when you try to downsize a 0.64 terminal, and you have to reduce the width, for instance, because you simply have to be narrower to, to, to fit on the same pitch or, or on a smaller pitch. You know, what effect does that have on the design? And, you know, what challenges does that cause? So we're going to look at each of these, um, these functions and take a real close look at how that, that affects a 0.5 design as opposed to a 0.64 design. So from the height standpoint, if you remember that previous chart with the different dimensions on it, the height of a 0.5 millimeter terminal is about 50% lower than a 0.64 terminal. So some of the most popular 0.64 terminals out there, like you know the, the upper one there is the generation Y, it's got these two beams, 180 degree bends. It's a great terminal, generates sports in a very compliant way there simply isn't room for those 180 degree bends on a terminal that's half the height. So, you know, downsizing generation Y simply wasn't an option because there just isn't the space. The lower picture there is the, the GET 0.64 terminal. Once again, a very, very popular terminal here in North America. It's a dual beam system, um, you know, very popular. But once again, if you take that height and reduce it by 50%, there simply isn't room for two beams nor is there room for the deflection of two beams. So once again, two of the, of the, the most popular 0.64 terminals in North America simply aren't an option because of the, uh, the, the huge jump between the height of a 0.64 terminal and the height of a 0.5 terminal. Okay, so if we look at the width direction, um, if you recall from that slide, you know, 0.64 it was 1.6 millimeters wide, and in order to package on these much closer pitches, the 0.5 millimeter terminals are one millimeter wide. That's a 40% decrease in the width. And since the, the width is a singular function, when you look at the equation for a cantilever beam or for a simply supported beam, the width is a singular function. So you know, a 40% decrease in the width is a 40% decrease in the normal force. Well, once again, the laws of physics don't change with a small terminal, so you still need to generate that good normal force. But now, you know, because of the, of the narrower width, you're at a 40% disadvantage right off the bat. Okay, stock thickness then is another feature that we have to look at. And there's some advantages to using thinner stock for smaller terminals. First of all, it's easier to form, um, and it's easier to crimp to small wires, which is often, you know, something that you want to do as well. But once again, you know, when you reduce, reduce the stock thickness, so you look at the, at the beam equations for a cantilever beam and a simply supported beam, the thickness is a cubic function, and that means that, you know, a very small change in thickness can amount to a very large change in the, the force. So in the case of going from 0.15 or 0.2 down to 0.15, that's an additional 60% decrease in the normal force. So, you know, that really puts you at a disadvantage uh, as far as trying to generate enough force to have, have a good system here. So um, you're left with then really is, you know, you've got the length. Well, if you decrease the length of a beam, a cantilever beam, for instance, or a simply supported beam, as you see from these equations, you can increase the force by decreasing the length, 
but only to a certain limit. You know, there's only a certain amount of force that you can generate before you start going plastic and, and yielding. And, um, and then that can be a big problem as well because you can easily overstress your beams. But, you know, the, so that shortening the length isn't necessarily a good way to try to make up for the narrower width or the decreased stop thickness. But the bigger concern is the stiffness. The stiffness of a beam is the, the amount of force you generate per unit of deflection. And the reason stiffness is very important in a terminal design is the stiffer the beam, the more sensitive that terminal is to variations in deflection. So for instance, if you're mating to a minimum thickness pin instead of a maximum thickness pin, the difference in that deflection can amount to a lot of change in normal force if you have a very stiff spring. So in the case of 050, where we change from 6.5 millimeters long on a 0.64 terminal down to 5.6 millimeters long on a 0.5 millimeter terminal, that results in a 57% increase in the stiffness of the beam, which means that that smaller terminal would be 57% more sensitive to tolerance variations, which means you could very easily lose control of your normal force. So once again, as we talked about, if the forces are, are you know, too high, you can't get connectors mated because you can't, you know, you have too high of a mating force, and if they're too low, you start losing your electrical function. So that's a really, really critical thing. So you can't just shorten the length to make up for the, the narrower width or the thinner stock thickness. And once again, the other problem with a very short, stiff beam is that it's easily overstressed. If you, you know, if you insert a you know, pin in and twist it and you overstress those beams, you can take a permanent set and lose a significant amount of your normal force. So, so that, once again, that, that's not a good way to make up for the, for the difference in the, in the forces. The um, if if we look at our TE portfolio, there's a probably the most popular 0.64 terminal in the world is our MQS terminal, and it's a very interesting beam geometry. It's two L-shaped beams that oppose each other, and the the beauty of the design is that because the beam is L-shaped, you can generate good normal force from a very narrow beam because of the L, L shape, it's, you know, the, the, the width isn't so, as port, so important as, as the, 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 the height, I guess you would say. And even the stock thickness, you can use a thinner stock, but once again, because of the L shape, um, the, the moment of inertia is more influenced by the A and the Y dimensions on this chart than by the W and the T dimensions. So because of the fact that this, L-shaped beam geometry can, can compensate for the width and thickness. It makes, really makes it the ideal beam geometry for downsizing. So with TE's designs, that's basically what we did. Um, so if, if you look at, the, look at the O50 design, we've basically taken that L-shaped beam and we put it in series with a torsional spring at the front end. And the reason for doing that is it, it, that also allows us to take that L-shaped beam and decrease the length of it a little bit as well, because when you put a beam in series, um, the, the spring rate gets lower. If you put a spring, if you, if you look at the, the picture of the springs on the top there, taking you back to your engineering mechanics class, if you take a spring that has a stiffness of 20 pounds per inch or whatever number you want to use, if you put those springs in parallel, then the stiffness would be 20 plus 20, which is 40. So that beam gets stiffer. So if you had a cantilever beam design and you decided to try to increase the force by putting another cantilever beam right on top, underneath it or on top of it, like a, you know, a, dual, a dual beam kind of a system, you end up with an extremely stiff spring with a very high spring rate. So the stiffness is very high, which means that it's very sensitive to those tolerance variations. But if you look at a spring in series, 
those springs, in, instead of both springs having the same deflection but higher force, those springs um, have the same force but more deflection. So with a spring in series, you, you can put two springs in series and the, it tends to reduce the stiffness rather than increase it, which is a huge, huge advantage here because we want to keep the good forces. We just want to do it in a more compliant way. So increasing the amount of deflection we have um, is a big advantage. And if you look at the ANSYS analysis that's running on the top right there, you can see how as this beam deflects, the stresses are distributed into that torsional section on the right-hand side. If this wasn't a spring in series and this L-shaped beam was just attached to a rigid wall, you would see a lot of bright red right at the base of those cantilever beams. But instead, by putting it in series and, and nicely distributing those stresses into the base as well, we get this, this, um, this very nice lowering of the stiffness, which gives us a very compliant beam with a low spring rate and good normal force control. So um, what, the other thing that was done then is, you know, we, we opposed, because of the size, instead of having two opposing L-shaped beams, it's a single L-shaped beam opposed by a fixed contact point. So we, we have two contact points that oppose each other. And it's a, a very easy geometry to form. There's no severe bends. And uh, we can also do 100% inspection of the beam gap in the die with a vision system. We can just look in the front and measure the beam gap to make sure, sure that we're, we're getting the proper, um, the proper form of the beam. So the L-shaped beam in series with a torsional spring is really ideal for miniaturization. It just it, it compensates for all those things that were making it difficult to generate, not just to generate the normal force, but to generate the normal force in the proper way, which, mean, which means it's a compliant spring with a low spring rate. Another thing that this geometry lends to us is that the beams are attached at the front. So we, we call it a forward hung beam and the beams point away from the mating pin. So when you're mating the connectors on the assembly line, there's simply no possibility of stubbing the tip of the pin on the tip of the beam. And that, means that we can, you know, have a, we, we can have a lot of deflection on our beam and have a very small beam gap without worried, being worried about the tin tips stubbing into the tip of that beam. So um, once again, the whole idea of having a low spring rate to minimize tolerance sensitivity and make it impossible for the tip of the beam to stub on the tip of the, of, of the pin are, are a big advantage here, you know, for this L-shaped uh, beam geometry. So once again, you know, the global experience, and we really do work closely together globally here at TE. Um, terminals are such, I mean, term, the terminal is the heart of the system. You know, without a good terminal, you got nothing, you know. So we understand the importance of the terminal systems, and we work globally uh, in the terminal design area to make sure that we not only know everybody's design, but we, we incorporate the best designs and, and utilize them globally because our customers are becoming more and more global. So it's important that we become more global as well. So once again, you know, that original L-shaped beam geometry from Japan worked so well and for so long that um, as the other regions became interested in miniaturization, that L-shaped beam geometry with a 0.15 stock thickness was, was incorporated across the globe. And the, the top picture there is a clean body terminal, meaning that the terminal has features which lock behind plastic beams in the connector. So the, the, as far as terminal retention, it, it's the, the plastic beam in the connector which is holding the terminal in place for primary retention. Um, and with that style, we have a, this original Japanese system, and we also have a US terminal that's cavity compatible with the TE Japan system. The second picture down is what we would call a locking lance terminal. In Europe, metal locking lances are very popular. Um, they used to be used in North America 
but maybe 25 years ago or so, the, the major warranty issue in vehicles was terminal back out, and they tracked it down to metal locking clamps that were getting deformed, and then when people would load terminals into connectors, you know, after time and vibration, they would work their way back out. So in North America, many of the OEMs would literally write into their design guidelines that thou shalt not use metal locking lances. So in North America, until very recently, we've really been focused on clean body designs. Europe, on the other hand, um, learned how to, to adjust to the locking lances. They learned how to design them very robustly so that they didn't get damaged. And locking lances have always been very popular in Europe. So in order to satisfy that market, we have the Nano MQS terminal, uh, which has the metal locking lance. And that's part of the quad lock product family that we'll show you in a minute here. Um, and we also have a US version of that that we call the Gen 50 LL, or Generation 50 locking lance terminal. So once again, that's cavity compatible with the European 0.5 millimeter locking lance terminal, the Nano MQS. And then the bottom picture shows um, a terminal that's in the MCON product family. Um, you know, MCON is another popular product family here at TE. And um, in this case, this is a clean body terminal for sealed applications. So, um, you know, once again, we um, have a US version of that, which is cavity compatible with the European MCON 050 terminal, for these clean body sealed type applications. So the advantages of having a product family are, are I think pretty evident from this slide. Now, th this is the, the quad lock family and nano MQS is part of that family. And the idea here is that the, 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 the locking point, the, the locking points line up so that it's very easy to do hybrid connectors. One of the real challenges in North America when you're designing a connector is that, you know, in a lot of cases, you know, uh, the 0.64 terminal is made by, you know, by this company, it's a certain design, and the 1.5 is made by this company, it's a different design. It might even have a different secondary locking strategy and a different location. So sometimes hybrid connectors can be a real challenge to design because all of the locking surfaces don't line up. So the idea of a product family is make all those points line up so that you know, if, in this case, you could imagine you could have a secondary lock that could slide in from the side, and it can slide in behind behind all these terminals, you know, with a very simple slide instead of having a very complex connector design. So, so that's the real advantage of a product family. Um, and uh, once again, the, the quad lock family is is very popular um, globally. So if we move now to the to the connector side, um, this slide really demonstrates the, the the advantage of the 0.5 millimeter size versus the 0.64 size. It's just a much much smaller system. You know, it's a you know 59 percent you know instead of 100 percent there. So it's it's almost almost half the size. So there's a really big size advantage um, with the 050 systems and back 10 years ago when the 050 size was added to the US car standard everybody thought that 0.64 is going to disappear you know this you know anytime you're carrying you know you have low current why why use a, a 0.64 if you can use an 050 but in reality they really hasn't taken off nearly to the extent that anybody thought it would and once again the, the some of the reasons for that are the familiarity thing, if we have something that works, why change it? But there are robustness concerns as well. Um, you know, it is a much smaller system. It's it's harder to handle. You know, people have to get used to handling a smaller system. So, you know, if somebody had a, a bad experience, they tried to know 58 years ago and they had a bad experience with it. Well, you know, that that one bad apple can kind of spoil the whole the whole bucket. So, People just get nervous and say, oh, we tried 050 once and we, we weren't real pleased with the robustness, so we, we use 0.64 whenever we can. And once again, th that can be okay, but with the electric vehicles and all these new launches going on, 
that's really the time to question, you know, are there some 050s out there that we can use that are robust? And uh, boy, if, if you can do that, then you can really save some, some serious size and, and weight. So here's just one example of, of the difficulty of downsizing a 0.64 connector. You know, the, the picture on the left there shows, you know, a primary latch locking into a 0.64 connector. And you can see that there's a lead-in funnel for the mating pin that has to be molded into that plug as well. So a typical 0.64 connector design has the primary latch and those lead-in funnels all molded into the same piece of plastic. Well, imagine, if you will, that that terminal is only half as high. Now that primary latch has to drop down, way down, so that it's now hidden by the lead-in funnel, and you can't mold the primary latch anymore. So in order to mold the primary latch, you have to get rid of most of the lead-in funnel. And if you get rid of most of the lead-in funnel, now when you go to make the, the plug to the header on the assembly line, the pin can miss the lead-in funnel because the lead-in funnel is so small. So that that is a, a really huge problem with O50, you know, compared to a 0.64. So what they did in Japan is they they divided the plug up differently than it used to be divided up. They the, the purple um, component is is a primary latch block, and then the gray component is a secondary lock independent secondary lock and the yellow piece is the main housing. So they've separated the primary lock, that flexible beam from the main housing, that yellow part. By separating it into two separate components, they're able to, to mold the leading edge of that primary latch without having to cut into the lead-in funnel area. So it, it allows easy molding of the of, of the plug because you know, things are exposed and then the core pins and things can be nice and large now, but it, it enables you to have a nice large lead-in funnel to prevent the pin from missing the lead-in funnel. Um, so once again, from a molding standpoint and um, the functionality of, of being able to, to mate without stubbing by splitting the primary latch and the lead-in funnel into two separate pieces of plastic, that was the solution to that problem. And this is just, you know, it's, it's a little hard to describe verbally what I was just talking about, but this is just a picture to represent what I described. This red piece is the core pin that would have to come in from the left to form the leading edge of that blue primary latch. And if you try to mold that primary latch in the same piece of plastic as the lead-in funnel, you simply have to eliminate most of the lead-in funnel to do that. So once again, that just demonstrates the pitfalls that people have when they try to downsize an existing 0.64 design and call it an 050. Okay, um, so once again, you know, we work very closely globally here at TE. We try to reuse proven design features. And, you know, in, in Japan, you know, the top right-hand view shows that the three-piece, we call it a guillotine style design that they typically use for their plugs. Here in North America, we divided the plug up a little bit differently. We have a, a two-piece design where the, the, the secondary lock is actually a hinged component. Um, so we were able to, to eliminate one of the three pieces by combining them. But the important thing is the lead-in funnel, that yellow area is a separate piece of plastic than the blue primary latch on that, that middle, middle um, part that we're showing there. So it's a two-piece hinge design that follows those best design practices that they had in Japan, you know, in order to, to accomplish a nice big lead-in funnel. The bottom shows the uh, one-piece hinge plug design that's used in the NEA for the, the locking lance terminal, the Nano MQS, because that doesn't have a primary latch, you don't have that particular issue. You're not trying to mold a primary latch. So, you know, you don't have that, that problem. So there, they're able to use a one-piece hinged uh, plug design. So on the header side, um, there are a number of different strategies that you can use to come up with a robust design. Now, on the header, you know, the key is you want to have a design that it doesn't, it, it has to control the alignment of the plug during mating to prevent stubbing. 
so you know in, in japan they because they had such a tight pitch they actually skipped circuits within a row to add keys um in order to to make it difficult to get in there and stub pins um so that keeps it very low profile but it does add length to the part because every, everywhere you put a key you're skipping a circuit so you know it does kind of make the part a little bit longer um and it also does require that you individually stitch the pins in the header you can't gang load a header you know loading all the pins at once because you're skipping you know various ones depending on on the key and configuration it's, if you have four or five different keying configurations, you might be skipping four or five different circuits. So you need to individually stitch the pins. And it does kind of require that guillotine style plug because you know, you're putting big slots in the plug that, that would be difficult to do otherwise. But it does allow you to get down to that really tight 1.5 millimeter pitch. In North America, we've incorporated a series of cooperating slots and, and ribs on the header and plug to prevent scooping and stubbing during ang angled mating. And we're using 1.8 pitch instead of 1.5 millimeter pitch because in North America, there's a strong preference for thin wall insulation. They don't you know, necessarily want to use ultra thin wall to get to that 1.5 millimeter pitch. Um, in Europe then, um, the, uh, the strategy is to have a very low profile plug and have the pins very deep, deeply recessed uh, um, into the mating face of the header shroud to once again prevent stubbing. So there's a number of different strategies you can use, but the key feature on the header itself is that interface needs to control alignment to prevent stubbing uh, during mating. Um, this chart shows um, some the, the huge range of, of sizes that we used to have um, out there in automotive terminals and U.S. car um, really did a good job of standardizing and you know, some of these what used to be very popular terminals are now not used so much anymore because globally people are starting to standardize. Our, our global terminal team updates this chart periodically and more and more these red dots are starting to align. So everybody, as our customers get more global, the, the terminals, the terminal sizes are becoming more global as well. So, um, so once again, that, that leads to simplification, um, you know, and, and it helps globalization. And once again, the, so that there's increasingly more global alignment with terminal size. There's more global acceptance of different terminal styles, clean body versus locking lance. And the test specifications though, you know, US car was trying to standardize on one spec and that was good for a while, but um, you know, now the people even in North America are starting to go their separate ways. And then there's, there are differences in the regions. You know, Europe has the LV214 specs. In Asia, they have a lot of OEM specific specs. So uh, from the testing standpoint, there are still lots and lots of differences globally. And just to, to kind of wrap up here, um, we have you know a, a number of different terminal systems in our 0.5 portfolio. You know, starting at the top left, you know that original 0.5 series from Japan, you know, clean body, 1.5 pitch, ultra thin wall insulation, um, validated to the Japanese OEMs. Um, underneath it then is our clean body Gen 50 clean body that we make in North America. It's cavity compatible with the one above it but it's 1.8 pitch, can utilize thin wall insulation. We test the US CAR-2 and US CAR-21, um, and you know, two, uh, anywhere from two to 28 position connectors. We focused on the US CAR-25 ergonomic push areas, um, and you know, with surface mount, you know, once again, trying to optimize retention forces. If you go to the top right, this is the Nano MQS locking lance design. Once again, it's a, a 1.8 millimeter pitch validated to LV214 and the slow motion bend test, which is a crimp test, which is different than US CAR-21, but it's the one that's popular in Europe. A lot of different connectors are tooled to that family and they have surface mount through whole and press fit versions of that. And then the bottom right is our Gen 50 locking lamps, which is the North American version of that. And there we validated the GMW 3191 and US CAR-21, I think, US CAR-2 validation is underway. And um, 
once again, we're cavity compatible and we can utilize the nano MQFs connector family with that terminal. So, um, you know, a nice variety of, of terminals that we have available. And um, our value proposition is just, you know, we've, we've got a lot of years of experience with these O50 terminals since 2006. We work globally to try to, to use lessons learned and best demonstrated practices, you know, very small pitch, 0.13 to 0.35 wires, um, you know, different header configurations available, um, FFC options available, um, you know, with robust anti-scooping features, you know, independent secondary locking, um, you know, locking lance and clean body designs, um, CPAs are optional. So once again, we have a, a really wide range of products available. So as you, you know, start launching these electric vehicles, don't forget that low voltage side. Take advantage of these things and get all these space and weight savings. This is the time to do it. So, you know, question everything. Why is this 0.64 if it could be a 0.5? Okay, well, that wraps up my portion of the presentation. Lisa, I'll turn it over to you for the Q&A section. Well, thank you, John. That was a wonderful presentation. Lots of great information and advice. Thank you. Uh, let's look at some of our questions. The first one is this. John, what was the biggest challenge to overcome when miniaturizing from 0.64 millimeter to 0.5 millimeter size terminals? Well, I would say the the biggest challenge is, is trying to generate the the normal forces that we needed to generate you know it's just what there's not a lot of material there and you know with that very small amount of material how, how are we going to how are we going to get there and um how are we going to get there in the proper way so so that was the biggest challenge because you know once again the terminal is the heart of the system if you don't do the terminal right it doesn't matter what plastic you put around it you know the terminal is really the the heart of the system so I would say that was the biggest challenge because the terminal just has to be right. You know, otherwise, there's, there's no way a connector can correct a terminal that isn't right. So, so that was the biggest challenge: is generating those forces and doing it in the proper way. Okay, very good. Next question, John: Which header style is the most popular for 0.5 millimeter connector systems? Through hole, surface mount, or press fit? Well, I, I guess I think the answer to that question probably depends on what region of the world uh, you happen to, to be in. In Japan, I, I think the surface mount is by far the most popular. In fact, they don't really use a lot of press fit in, in, in Asia to begin with, especially Japan. So once again, because they were focusing on the, the 1.5 pitch, it really drove them to surface mount and once again, the freeing up the bottom side of the board. So I would say the answer is easily surface mount in, uh, in in Asia, especially Japan. Um, in Europe, I think probably the, the press fit is, is the most popular. Um, once again, at TE, we've got nano multi-spring for the O50 size terminals, which is a really good system. Um, it's very popular on, uh, on our 0.5 products there um, because, you know, when you get to this pitch, you know, wave soldering, can be problematic. So press fit eliminates that that step. You know, you, you do have to press the connectors onto the header, but you don't have to solder them. So you can use a lower cost header material. You don't need the, the extra the extra metal pieces on the end for strain relief uh, to protect the surface mount joints. So certainly in Europe, I think that the answer would be press fit. In North America, I think it's kind of, you know, a little bit of both. Um, and there are through hole applications as well, but, um, so, I, you know, once again, I, I think service mount in, in Asia, press fit in Europe and, and North America is probably a 50-50. A Good to know. Thanks, John. Uh, someone in our audience is asking, would you please show the red dot U.S. car, et cetera, chart again? And what are the main common sizes? John? <laughs> yes. Okay. Trying to get to the right slide here. Okay, so for some reason it's changing on me here. Okay, 
Okay, so I believe that's the chart that you're referring to. So, you know, years ago, I mean, th there were a lot of different intermediate sizes. Um, you know, one of TE's, you know, sizes was a 1.0 terminal. You know, the 040, the 040 series from Japan was extremely popular, still is, as you can see, it's got a red dot in Japan. Um, but once again, that really wasn't adopted here in North America. So, <clears throat> so the starting at the small side and working our way up, there's the the new 0.5 millimeter system. I say new, it's 10 years old, but just not used much. The next size up would be 0.64. The next size is a 1.2. That's a relatively recent addition, by the way, the 1.2 size. That was very popular in Europe, so it was added in North America as well. Then there's a 1.5 millimeter, then 2.8 then 6.3, and then 9.5. And those dimensions are referring to the width of the mating header pin. That's how a terminal size is defined. So, so those are the terminal sizes that US CAR has standardized on, and the rest of the world is pretty much following suit, I would say, um, which is good. Once again, it makes globalization and having global customers um, a, a, lot, a lot easier if we're all you know, if you don't have to have, you know, so many different terminal sizes in the vehicle, that does simplify things for the harness makers, especially in, in crimping terminals and that type of thing. Very good. Thanks, John. Um, let's see, this question. John, what are the regional differences and preferences for 0.5 millimeter terminal and connector systems? Well, I think the big, biggest regional difference probably on the terminal side is is the clean body versus locking lance question as i said before in north america historically locking lances are a no-no i mean literally we're in the oem's design guidelines that thou shalt not have a metal locking lance so so that certainly is, is a big difference with the mayo where they you know they, they had these terminal systems that they've been using and you know they they were able to to tweak them to to make the locking lances robust and be able to, to to go through the harness making process without being damaged. Um, Asia, you know, once again, specifically Japan, I believe their preference is, is for clean body, but they do use some locking lance as well. So, um, so once again, historically North America is clean body, but you know, once again, we're getting global, and um, you know, locking lances are being accepted more and more here in North America, and the harness makers are learning to to, to deal with them. Very good. And with that, John, we're at the end of our webinar. I want to thank you for this discussion today. It's, it's just been wonderful. I also want to thank our audience for being with us. A survey will pop up on everyone's screen immediately following our program. Please tell us what you thought of our webinar by answering just three questions. This webinar will be available for viewing on our website. An email will be sent, will be sent to everyone who registered for today's program as soon as the archive is ready. Once again, thanks for watching.